discretion, used nine times in nine verses of the Bible, the act of sound and right judgment before God and men. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry and welcome to the Quick Study Weekend Edition as we study the Bible, going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. He would not let God's people go. God did not ask him to give up gold or his position, or political power. He just wanted him to let the people go. Pharaoh would not do it. He had obsessions. And that's what we're going to talk about today in Exodus chapter 8, the obsessions of Pharaoh, and also how those obsessions get in our life and how to overcome them. So if you're dealing with obsession and addiction, stay tuned. We'll watch how God deals with Pharaoh and how you can avoid it. Also, Bible archaeology is being studied by Corey Hembry. Corey? Today, we are going to study if Ramses II could have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and we're also taking a look at the symbolism behind some of the plagues of Egypt. Who is the Pharaoh of Moses' day? What do you think? We'll find out what Corey thinks later. We also have Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan, what's up? Well, many creationists believe in what is known as the vapor canopy model. We're going to take a look at what it is and if it agrees with Scripture. All right, so we're going to look at that related to the flood and all kinds of different things coming up today on this particular weekend edition of Quick Study. Also coming up later on how you can get your own wise guide print version of this program, Learning the Bible and its Wisdom in Our Daily Lives. Stay there as we continue. Because of the nature of the book of Exodus, it's very fantastic. There are a lot of people who love reading the book of Exodus and people love to quarrel over when exactly it happened in history. Well, right now, you and I are going to take a look at some of this issue. When did the Exodus happen? Many people have claimed that there's no evidence of Israel living in Egypt. If true, this should be quite troubling to Bible believers. Even if direct evidence wasn't found, there should still exist circumstantial evidence. A prosperous time under Joseph, followed by an economic collapse post-Exodus. However, to look for circumstantial evidence, you must be looking in the right place. Traditional scholarship has named Ramses II as the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Why? because the Bible says the Israelites built up Pithom and Ramses as supply cities for Pharaoh. Ramses, it said, was named after the Pharaoh. But what if a later scribe copying Exodus decided to update the place name? There is another reason for dating Moses to the reign of Ramses II, the chronology of Mentho a 3rd century BC Egyptian priest. He lived after the conquest of Alexander the Great, in a much different Egypt than the Egypt of Exodus. Mentho divided Egypt's ancient pharaohs into ruling family groups called dynasties. One of the issues is that no full copy of his work survives, only quotations found in other historians' works. We learn from one of these historians that many of the kings in Mentho's list actually ruled at the same time, just in different areas. But traditional scholarship has them ruling one after another. That means our chronology could be off by hundreds of years. 
add that to the fact that we have the mummy of Ramses II, meaning he's not at the bottom of the Red Sea, and that his son Merneptah boasted about defeating Israel already established in the Promised Land, tells me that Ramses II was not the Pharaoh of the Exodus. We've been looking in the wrong time. It's time to look at God's wise guys in the Bible. Now, listen carefully. The 10 plagues of Egypt all had spiritual significance. It's true. The religious system of the ancient Egypt was complex and deeply rooted in mysticism. Now, it was, however, a real demonic darkness that was in that land. Bondage and obsession were very much the best fruit of this demonic darkness. Pharaoh's unwise religion put him at the center of power and a god in it rewarded him as that god by worshiping him. So to be dominated by obsessions of his cultic religion, well, these were emblems of humiliating and embarrassing to him because his very own emblems took him over. That's what the frogs are about. However, the wise guy of this story is Moses, who obeys God without question. Moses understands God is doing something in Egypt, far beyond anything that they could see or understand. He was wise. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up, and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying when I shall intercede for you, for your servants, and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you in your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them, as the Lord had said. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. Let my people go. God did not ask Pharaoh to give up his gold. He did not ask Pharaoh to give up his political power or his position. He simply asked Pharaoh to stop making slaves of the Hebrews, to let his people go. Now, Pharaoh, of course, is very hard-hearted and stubborn. He thinks himself to be a god. So today, as we land in Exodus chapter 8 going through the Bible, 
we learn some interesting things about obsessions. Now, Pharaoh was obsessed with his own religion and himself, and he had a power addiction. Now, from this particular incident here, specifically the incident of the plagues of the frogs, we learn something about obsessions, their root, where they come from, and how to overcome them, especially in our lives today. And the Lord knows we have many obsessions in our culture today. I mean, it's getting crazy out here, isn't it? So how do we break free from those chains and those bonds? Let's look at the wisdom of the Word of God as he presents us with Pharaoh, the very unwise guy of the Bible. Studying Exodus chapter 8, beginning with verse 1 through 4, we learn, And the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, Go to Pharaoh. I want you to say to Pharaoh, Thus says Jehovah the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all of your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and in and out of your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, yuck, in the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls, really? And the frogs shall come upon you and on your people and on all of your servants." I'll tell you what, Pharaoh was obsessed with this religion that saw the frog as a fertility god. And so obsessions are the fruit of demonic domination. Pharaoh's mind was dominated by demons. God's deliverance frequently involves using these obsessions to shake us out to freedom. Uh, how many times have I heard somebody who has been bound with alcohol finally hit the bottom? I mean, really hit the bottom before they realize their obsessions overtake them. God allows it to happen to make sure that we understand the absolute depravity that we put ourselves in because of the oppression of, addiction, of addictions and obsessions. And so God will often use that. It's important for us to recognize that in our wisdom, especially in dealing with others. Well, let's carry on because we can learn some more lessons here, and that is this from verse 5 of chapter 8 of Exodus. The Bible says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the river, over the pond, and cause the frogs to come up out of the land of Egypt. Well, Aaron did. He stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs, man, did they come up. They come up and they covered Egypt. And, and the magicians, you know, Pharaoh's uh, black magic guys, they did so with their enchantments. Well, that helped. Brought more frogs up in the midst of a frog obsession. Well, then, uh, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go, and they may sacrifice to the Lord. Well, that was a lie. That's a lie. But Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying, I shall, When I shall intercede for you and your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from your houses and that they may retain or remain only in the river. So he says, Pharaoh, you go ahead and decide. So he said, well, tomorrow then, let he, uh, and, and he said, well, let it be according to the word, your word, that you may know that there is only one God like the Lord our God. Brings us to this next uh, study wise point. Obsessions can only be overcome and conquered when we finally submit to that higher power, which we name Jesus Christ. He's got a name. His name is Jesus Christ as the higher power able to deliver us. He is the one with all authority. The Pharaoh couldn't admit that. And so this was a big farce. Now that brings us in. Let's see the end of the story. What happens when he refuses to acknowledge? All right, we go on with verse 11. There's five verses here. Well, the frogs, they shall depart from you and your house and your servants and from your people. So they shall, uh, they shall remain only in the river. And then Moses and Aaron, they went out from Pharaoh. And Moses, of course, cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the words of Moses. And the frogs, they died out of the houses and out in the courtyards and out of the fields. And they gathered them together. Boy, did they stink. The land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, see, he hadn't hit bottom yet. When he saw there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed the words that the Lord had said. Now, this is really tragic because this brings us to this point, this study-wise point. Obsessions often return to us because of the hardness of heart towards God. But you see, beloved, when we are willing to soften our lives, to change our lifestyles under God, we are delivered. 
We learned that the only way Pharaoh could ever be set free of this addiction was to face death himself, which he eventually did, but it killed the firstborn all around him. And so, beloved, we must allow God. The wisdom here is this. We must allow God through our struggles and our oscillations with our addictions and our obsessions, we must allow Him to soften our heart. That's the wisdom here. Don't harden your heart. Every time God brings something to you that's terrible and hard, allow Him to soften your heart with it. Don't become hard and bitter, but give it to Jesus Christ and ask Him to help you soften your heart to God, and He will deliver you from your addictions and your obsessions. Now the scripture that we're covering to get today begins in, Gen in Exodus sorry, 7 and it deals with some of the plagues of Egypt. So right now you and I are going to look into the symbolism that was behind some of these literal historic plagues. Ancient Egyptians worshipped many gods they believed controlled nature. In that cultural context, how would the ten plagues of Egypt have been interpreted? The first message is found in the Nile River. The god of the Nile was worshipped as Egypt's life source. But this sustainer of life was ruined with one word from the god of Abraham. The second plague was an exodus of frogs from the dying river. It must have seemed that their frog goddess, who watched over childbirth for so long, had been cast out by Yahweh. When Moses struck the dirt and a plague of gnats followed, Egypt's god of earth was shamed, revealed by a slave as bringing torment, not life. The fourth plague brought swarms of pestering insects, and yet they didn't come near the Hebrews. The Hebrews' god had promised them rest from their slavery. Both cows and bulls were sacred in Egypt, the cow representing the mother goddess and the bull the father of Egypt. Yahweh did not honor these false parents. The fifth plague diseased and killed Egypt's livestock. The plague of boils insulted Egypt's rituals of religious health and cleanliness. The hail proved their sky and storm gods useless in the path of Yahweh. Their protector of crops could not save them from locusts blown in at Moses' command. The ninth foreboding plague of darkness cut to the heart of Egypt's ruling class, not even the all-powerful sun god could shine through a curse from the god of the slaves. The final plague ruined Pharaoh. His power, his priest's power, their god's power, none of it could withstand an angel from God. Imagine their horror when they realized the Hebrews were spared by smearing the blood of the animal Egypt worshipped as life-giver. Israel's future, their firstborn sons were saved in acknowledging that Egypt's god was not a god at all. What is prophecy, really? Is there really such a thing as prophecy or a prophet in today's modern world? In the last two years, many so-called prophets, many of them biblical prophets, they claim, have predicted the end of time and all kinds of events, but much of it has not come true. Join the Quick Study on-air ministry team as they tackle the difficult subject of biblical prophecy and biblical prophets in today's world. To get your copy today, video DVD of Prophecy, What Is It According to the Bible, send $25 or more to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. In the United States sent to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. 
Or you can call at 519-940-8338. Or in the U.S., 724-733-8336. As we continue on the weekend edition of Quick Study Television, thank you for watching. We come upon Cosmic Mysteries, in which Ryan is exploring the various models that could have occurred uh, over the vapor canopy model. Ryan? Well, there has been some confusion as to what the word expanse refers to in Genesis chapter 1. Well, today we're going to take a close-up look at these passages, and we're going to use Scripture to interpret Scripture to figure out what the word expanse actually refers to. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, the Bible says, quote, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. Close quote. This passage leaves us with a question. What is the expanse? Some creationists believe in what is called the vapor canopy model, this is the idea that the expanse referred to in this passage is the atmosphere of the Earth and that there is a canopy of water above it. Those who hold to the vapor canopy model believe that these waters above the atmosphere played a big role in the global flood. But does the Bible support this vapor canopy model? Using the Bible to interpret the Bible, we come across some passages that give us some clues on the matter. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, it says, quote, And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth." Close quote. Take note of the little word in here in this passage. The Hebrew word for in has essentially the same meaning. So the scripture here is saying that the sun, moon, and stars are in the expanse. According to this passage, the expanse can't be simply the atmosphere, but instead interstellar space. Applying this verse to the previous one in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God is actually telling us that there are waters above interstellar space. Quote, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse, from the waters that were above the expanse. In Psalm chapter 148, verses 1 through 4, we find more evidence for this interpretation. Quote, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars, praise him you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Close quote. Take note on the order in which this passage is written. This is a list that suggests we are going farther and farther out. At the very end of this list, the waters above the heavens are mentioned. The vapor canopy model says that the waters above the expanse collapsed in the Genesis flood. However, this passage in Psalms was written many years after the flood, and it says the water is still present. The vapor canopy model has quite a number of biblical problems. The verse often used to support the vapor canopy model is Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. It says, quote, let the waters bring forth abundantly, and swarm with living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth in the open expanse of the heavens." Close quote. Some English translations use the phrase, in the open expanse. The English in this particular translation of the Bible suggests that the expanse is simply the atmosphere. It is always a good idea, however, to check the original language of the Bible. The original Hebrew passage here literally says, quote, "...and let birds fly around over the earth." on the face of the expanse." Close quote. The word in is never used. Now the reason a lot of creationists like to hold on to the idea of the vapor canopy model is because it explains a lot scientifically. But next weekend we will see that the canopy model is not actually scientifically necessary. Very interesting. Thank you, Ryan, for your contribution. Of course, Ryan also is one of our teachers in creation science on Bible Discovery Seminary. And if you want to find out more, I'll tell you in a minute about that. We also have Corey coming up next week on the Quick Study Weekend Edition. What are you studying next week, Corey? Well, because we're getting into the Law of Moses, we are going to be taking a look at this idea of sacrifices in the ancient world.
And that's important, Corey, because the archaeology part of uh, studying the Bible is not simply about archaeology, but it's also about Bible history. Why is exactly. it important to understand Bible history? Mm -hmm. Well, to understand biblical history will give us a context in which to understand what the Bible is actually trying to say to us today. So it helps us to interpret the Bible, which is very, very important. And of course, Ryan mentioned it earlier, using the Bible to interpret the Bible. It's called the spirit of analogy uh, by those who have gone to seminary. Briefly, I want to give you our addresses and I want you to consider writing to us for the Quick Study Wise Guide this year. P.O. Box 150 in the United States of America. That's in Murraysville, Pennsylvania. I have a friend in Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. I think I have a few of them there. 724-733-8336. In Canada, we're going to go to B.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Remember, you can reach us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Now the Pharaoh of ancient Egypt was, well, addicted to power and attention. This condition is frequent in modern media and in modern politics causing corruption. But when we let the wisdom of God work in us, we avoid the trappings of power addictions, which render us invalid as human beings. The obsession for godlike status is a lying trap. May we change the way we think today and let God's wisdom work in our lives with each other. Hey, before we go, let's wise up today and take a look at the scripture. Our wise up segment, we're studying Proverbs chapter 3, verses 33 to 35. Here's a portion of that passage. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Well, everybody would say, well, yeah, I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be good with God. I want to be in God's favor. Well, the only way to become good with God's favor is not by do good things, but it's by coming to Jesus Christ. The Bible says that it is Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father God except through Him. No woman, no man. That's what Bible says in John chapter 14, and I believe the Bible. If you sense that in your spirit today, and you know what I'm talking about, believe me, there's nothing you can do to make yourself righteous, but Jesus did it for you. That's what the cross was all about. He died on the cross for you and me. So our sins would be paid for. He rose again on the third day for you and me so that we could receive the gift of eternal life. And he calls to you today. Come to Jesus and pray, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again to give me eternal life and I make you Lord of my life. Come to Jesus today. He's waiting for you. Thanks again for joining us on the weekend edition of the Quick Study Television Program. Remember, in our Wise Up segment, I do a daily commentary on YouTube. To find out more about our daily commentary on YouTube about the Proverbs, subscribe to me on YouTube, Rod the Number 4 TV, Rod 4 TV. For more information, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com.